Well, uh, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers amis, bonsoir. On vient maintenant à la dernière partie de cette uh, réunion d'aujourd'hui visant à célébrer et commémorer le 120e anniversaire de la Conférence des droits internationaux privés, la plus ancienne des institutions juridiques de la, internationales de l'AE et dont, euh, je dirais, le premier contributeur, si l'on veut, à la renommée de l'AE en tant que capitale mondiale du droit et de la justice. Euh, nous avons ici un protagoniste de la conférence, le secrétaire général Hans van Loon. Les collègues de Hans ont, au bureau permanent ont bien voulu euh, me demander de l'interviewer ce soir. Et en tant qu'ancien ami de la conférence, depuis presque un demi-siècle, et, et ami de Hans lui-même personnellement, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi et, et en même temps un grand honneur de le faire. Et je tiens donc d'abord à remercier euh, les collègues qui ont voulu m'inviter. Euh, mais je vais vous prévenir, je ne suis ni un journaliste, ni un présentateur de télé. Et, et, je ne connais pas le métier, donc. Mais euh, comme le dit euh, Don Juan, au commandeur de l'Opéra, euh, « Faro quel que potro », je ferai mon mieux pour euh, accomplir cette tâche. Uh, « I don't have to spend many words » to introduce to you Hans van Loon. These previous speakers have, uh, almost all of them, said uh, some uh, words of congratulations about him. He has been with the Permanent Bureau for uh, a long time, 35 years, if I'm correct. And uh, half of the time he has been the Secretary General, from 96 onwards. Let me recall that the conference has been uh, having a permanent uh, secretariat only for roughly half of its life, mm -hmm. since 55, yeah. when the Permanent Bureau was set up under the statute. Following the trend after the Second World War to uh, rely not only on cooperation between states, but to organize such cooperation through permanent structures. And uh, since uh, 55, the conference has had three secretary generals who served for more or less equivalent time, more or less, some, some years more, some years less. You have Matthijs van Hoogstraten, George Droz, and Hans van Loon. But Hans was a member of the Permanent Bureau for much longer than his term as, uh, as a Secretary General. So he was there also during, I think, all the previous mandate uh, the, of the previous Secretary General. And uh, uh, he was, has been a direct witness of the developments in the conference and uh, of the challenges that these developments implied. Among them, uh, the most uh, evident uh, challenge, but also the most complex one probably, has been the growth of the conference. Uh, from a small organization, essentially an organization of uh, European states, into a more global organization. And this has been a major change in the life of the conference, as it had been in the previous part of its life before the adoption of the Statute in 51. Um, I wish just, just to give an impression of this, I want to recall that the Statute was adopted in 51 by 16 states, only 16 states, the only extra-European state being Japan. And that 20 years later, or in 71, 
there was a year of my first presence in a, in a special yeah. commission. Uh, last before your time, Hans. Before my time. Yeah. We were 14 delegates around the table in the then new premises of the conference in Yavastrat. However, if we look now at the beginning of the century, it was uh, the number of delegates has grown so much that it was difficult to accommodate them in the academy uh, conference room that was able to receive almost 300 students, however. So it was a, a massive, uh, huge development. Now, my first question, Hans, is the following. Which were the challenges that the conference had to face with, to deal with this transformation into the global situation? Has uh, the increase of interest, of world interest in the conference been just a reflection of the globalization of international life, or was it due to the policies, to new policies of the conference as compared with the past? Thank you, uh, Fausto. Thank you very much. And thank you, first of all, for doing me the honor of uh, interviewing or grilling me. Um, I'm, I'm very honored that you, uh, you accepted to do that. Yes, there has been uh, um, quite an, an, an impressive uh, growth these, uh, these last uh, years. But let me start perhaps by illustrating a little bit from where we came. Uh, you've already given some figures. When I joined the Hague Conference in 78, we had uh, 29 members and a full handfuls of states that were parties to conventions. When I took over from Georges Droz, that had grown to 43, and about 40 states that were um, parties to conventions without being members. And the situation at the time was still that um, the, the, the totality was geographically very limited. We had the appearance, on, despite all the efforts, of being a very Europe-centered organization and almost a, a closed club. Just to, to give an illustration, I was sent by my predecessor, Raj Dros, to New Delhi in the beginning of the 80s to assist the Af Af Asian African League of consultative organization uh, with the drafting of a bilateral model agreement on service and uh, evidence. And of course, I was, was quite happy and honored to do that. But in our mind, we had the idea, why not, why not tell them just to join the service and evidence convention? Beautiful conventions would work for them. And I tried that on them. And the answer was, you know, it's great work that you're doing in The Hague, but this is a different region. You cannot expect uh, instruments worked out in, in far Europe to be useful here. Now, if you look at the status today of ratifications uh, of the Hague Convention, you will see that India and many other countries in, in Asia, and it's beginning in Africa, have joined these uh, two conventions. And that is an, an, a source of enormous uh, satisfaction uh, for me. So we had to work hard to overcome the, uh, the image of, of, of um, being a European uh, club, um, and w went actively uh, to, to seek uh, uh, new members, pushed in part by the fact that the European Union, uh, among itself, uh, took it on it to start legislating uh, in the field. Now, what have been the, the, the challenges? If you look at the member states that we have uh, been honored to welcome and the states that have joined the Hague Convention, you will see that they come from all different uh, groups. They, they're countries from the common law, they're countries with a continental law tradition, they're countries with a religious uh, background. And yet I don't believe that that was the biggest challenge. If I uh, ask myself uh, and look back at the discussions on new topics, for instance, uh, from the last years, um, we haven't had many new um, challenges in, in, in that respect. The, the same the, the questions we had, um, preferences, uh, were already there among the, the traditional uh, member countries. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest uh, challenge for us um, has been to accommodate very different levels of uh, legal development, often not always linked with different le levels of mm -hmm. economic development. That has been a, a great challenge. And if I may give mm. one, one example of how we dealt with that yes. in uh, our most recent convention on the recovery of child support, um, 
where we negotiated with a large number of countries, um, there, there is a clear principle of free legal assistance to uh, applications for the recovery of child, of child support. Um, but that went a little far for certain countries which don't have legal assistance in their systems. So we've introduced a second layer where countries can make the delivery of free legal assistance subject to certain, uh, certain conditions. Similarly, there is a system for enforcement that is very strict, mm. and countries that are not so familiar may uh, build in a few more uh, yeah. controls. Uh, you see, when I was uh, uh, referring to new policies, or old policies, depends yeah. if they're really new, uh, it was because I have the impression, maybe it's just an impression, that uh, the, the conference has uh, tried to shift then more and more towards rules of cooperation in lieu of rules uh, tending to unification. Uh, let me be more precise. Uh, the, the statute of the conference says clearly, it's very short, the purpose of the conference. The statute says the the purpose of the Hague, I think it's in French, the original, but the purpose of the Hague Conference is to work for the progressive unification of the rules of private international law. So the purpose is unification of private international law. That's in the statute. However, if one looks at the history of the conference, the most successful conventions are those who are not dealing exactly with unification, but are dealing with cooperation. There are some unification aspects, but dealing with cooperation. Look at the convention on civil procedure, for instance. The first successful convention was in 94, 18, 94. Then it was revised in, in 1905. Yeah. Then it was the first successful uh, conference, the real uh, Cheval de Bataille of the conference in 54, with the convention, uh, with the new structure of the conference. Then again, it was split into three conventions, service, taking of evidence, access to justice, in, uh, uh, subsequently. Um, th so it was a successful form formula. That then was, uh, in a way, transferred into the Child Adoption Convention, yeah. that was uh, a cooperation convention instead of uh, a, a unification convention, really, although there are some unifying aspects. And the same has been taken in uh, the parental responsibility, in the adoption, and later in maintenance. Is this change in uh, uh, being a choice uh, that uh, allowed also to work at this in term different layers as you were saying before? Um, first of all, I think this is part of a broader uh, development in international, in international law. Wolfgang Friedman wrote a book in the 1960s um, where he distinguished between the law of coexistence and the law of cooperation. The law of coexistence with emphasis on sovereignty and, and, and that he described a movement towards the law of cooperation where states work together in among other things, to make the life of, of, of citizens uh, uh, easier. And that is clearly what has also uh, been reflected in, in, the, in the Hague, Hague work. Um, we, we found that uh, simply delimiting uh, jurisdiction of courts, uh, the, the adoption convention is a good example. We had a very nice convention going back to 1965, which was a classical private international law convention yeah. with rules on jurisdiction, applicable law, recognition and enforcement, wonderful conventions ratified by three states, exactly. among which there were only one or two adoptions per, per year. So we had to rethink that and ask ourselves, uh, how come that this is not more widely ratified? It's such an important global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then it appeared very soon that, first of all, we needed to involve these countries. You can not legislate for others. You have to, to work with them. And second, that the emphasis had to be put much more on mechanisms for communication, cooperation, setting up of machinery, machinery that is able to deliver services to citizens. And so instead of abstract uh, private international law rules, we more and more have had to design um, systems that are directly at the service of, of our member states, which led to a whole new evolution in our work as a permanent bureau, but also 
much more engagement and involvement of our member states who have done a terrific job creating all these authorities, equipping them and, um, and so on. We have now more than 2,500 central authorities and thousands of competent authorities under various conventions. Um, that's really a very, very impressive movement. Mm. You, are, you are touching now upon an issue that has been already dealt with in the previous panel to a certain yeah. extent, uh, that is the implementation yeah. of, the, of the convention, which is, uh, I think, a real, a real uh, asset of the, of the conference, to have uh, put the accent not only on the legislation, but work for, unif if I'm correct, work for unification through implementation in a way, mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. having yeah. the, the, the rules uh, applied. Um, is that abandoning, uh, to a some extent, uh, the role of initiator of legislation? No, 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 no not at all. Uh, my view, I mean, in my view, certainly not. And most of our work on, on in the, in the non-legislative field is based I on that. reaction, I know there was some criticism that was flat <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> that, that no. it's becoming just an implementation uh, no, but office but and not a uh, not, uh, legislative office. But, but, but the, the, the interesting thing about so much of our work is that it is so um, clearly based on binding cooperative frameworks. So there's a firm treaty base, and, and on that basis we have developed a lot of uh, tools mm -hmm. to, uh, to, make, uh, to make it work. Est-ce qu'on peut aborder un autre défi? Euh, on a parlé du défi de la mondialisation de la conférence. Mais de l'autre côté, il y a eu dans le monde, euh, notamment en Europe, mais pas seulement en Europe, une euh, régionalisation progressive du droit international privé. Alors, tout spécialement, je prends l'Europe, par exemple. 27 États, donc sur les presque 80 qui constituent le, le, le membership actuel, de la, euh, de la conférence et bientôt 28 euh, avec l'adhésion de la Croatie et en perspective d'autres états se sont donnés ces dernières années une discipline uniforme dans presque tous les domaines du droit de la privée ah oui. alors c'est un défi auquel tu as dû faire face durant ton mandat parce que ça s'est produit pendant ton mandat, la, la régionalisation du DIP en Europe euh, date du traité d'Amsterdam, en fait, euh, donc le, le, à partir de 1999 ouais, ouais. euh, du siècle dernier. Donc, euh, comment as-tu... As Est-ce qu'il y a encore une place pour la conférence as Comment as-tu réussi à garder l'autonomie, l'effectivité de la conférence euh, de nouveau, c'est l'accent sur la mise en œuvre qui a aidé ou euh, il y a d'autres aspects qui ont, euh, d'autres instruments que tu as mis en place pour sauvegarder l'autonomie la, de la conférence vis-à-vis -vis de cette imposante ré régionalisation d'un groupe important de membres. Je, je dirais effectivement que les, les plus grands défis des, des deux euh, derniers dernière décennie sont la mondialisation et qui euh, ont été la mondialisation et la régionalisation, la communautarisation du droit international privé. Il y a d'autres facteurs, l'impact direct de la technologie, certaines questions de dialogue interculturel, mais ces deux facteurs euh, ont, ont, ont vraiment caractérisé cette, euh, cette période. Euh, et c'était euh, c'était dur parce que euh, on n'avait pas le, le bénéfice de de pouvoir regarder vers, vers, vers le droit. Il y, a des il y avait des incertitudes. Le traité d'Amsterdam avait créé la possibilité pour l'Union, la, la communauté à l'époque, d'aller légiférer dans le domaine du droit international privé. Et euh, c'était quelque chose de tout à fait nouveau. Euh, et euh, ça nous a posé quelques problèmes. Euh, certaines Certains, euh, certaines voix disaient, mais où la conférence du, du passé maintenant C'est l'Europe qui va s'occuper du droit international privé. Ne, ne vous inquiétez pas, la conférence, c'est fini. Euh, heureusement, c'était une minorité, mais c'était quand même euh, une période un peu difficile, mais c'était difficile pour tout le monde. Par exemple, la Commission européenne, qui euh, s'était euh, vue chargée de nouvelles responsabilités, elle avait au sein de la conférence de la haie uniquement le statut d'observateur. Or, or, elle devait se prononcer au, lieu de tous ces, au nom de tous 
tous les États. Les États membres de l'Union ne savaient pas très bien euh, comment ça devrait se passer. La Commission, simple observateur, est-ce qu'on devrait se prononcer pour, pour les autres mmh. Il y avait les, les États tiers qui se disaient, mais qu'est-ce qui se passe euh, À qui avons-nous affaire à la Commission, à les, aux États Donc c'était difficile. Mais je crois qu'avec beaucoup de, de sagesse de, de tout le monde, on a euh, pu... Euh, pu, euh, pu euh, faire face euh, aux difficultés et ce qui a été très important évidemment ça a été que euh, l'Union Européenne, la communauté est devenue membre de la conférence en, en 2007 ça a été un, un, un grand pas et on a ensuite vu par exemple une magnifique coopération au sein de l'Union entre commission présidence, état membre et le reste de nos états membres lors des négociations sur la convention recouvrement d'aliments et plus récemment, on a organisé des, des séminaires ensemble. Euh, L'Union euh, s'intéresse beaucoup à la mise en œuvre des, des conventions, pas seulement à l'intérieur de l'Union, mais aussi dans les relations avec les États tiers. a été très généreux à subventionner des, des séminaires qu'on a organisés. Euh, donc, euh, je crois que finalement, le bilan est, est très positif. Mais euh, il est vrai que pour nous tous, c'était une période assez, mmh. assez, assez difficile et surtout que euh, ça coïncidait avec nos travaux en matière de jugement, mmh. où il y, a, il y avait aussi de grandes euh, euh, incertitudes. Et euh, je crois que toujours, toujours que l'idée de, de combiner la session diplomatique sur cette convention sur l'élection de fort et la décision sur l'admission de l'Union européenne a été une, une décision sage qui a combiné deux dossier difficile et euh, on a pu les résoudre euh, avec, euh, avec succès. Mmh. Mmh. Et, et ce qui est intéressant, je, je voulais dire, dire ça encore, c'est qu'on a vu des développements similaires, euh, par exemple, en ce qui concerne les pays latino-américains qui ont suivi l'exemple des pays européens, se concertent avant les, euh, les réunions, pendant les réunions, et viennent aussi de plus en plus avec une, euh, une voix. Et ça peut beaucoup faciliter les, les négociations. Pas toujours, mais... Oui. Donc, on peut s'attendre à un futur de la conférence comme coordinateur des régions, peut-être. Je, je crois que la, la, la force, quand même, la plus forte, est la mondialisation. Oui. Euh, ça a une, une, un impact sur nous qui, 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 qui est énorme. Et les différentes régions mmh. ont besoin d'une plateforme où ils... Mmh où elles peuvent s'entendre, elles peuvent coopérer. Oui. Et ça a été pleinement reconnu euh, par, par, par l'Union et euh, géré avec beaucoup de sagesse aussi. Oui. Now, uh, Hans, uh, one question which may be easy to answer, but not necessarily very easy, if they want to put to you, is the following. Uh, we, I think we all agree in this room that uh, uh, private international law is probably the most complex, the most sophisticated field of law. Something that sometimes each of us has this experience probably in his life, talking to people, even lawyers, to uh, have the reaction that uh, even, except specialized lawyers, do not understand much of private international law because it's too complicated, it is uh, too abstract also, Uh, looks very distant from uh, daily life, actually. Now, and the conference may appear to many as a sort of a distant tower, maybe, uh, where a group of specialists spend their time in long debates, sophisticated debates, uh, uh, having no or very little impact on real life, uh, except perhaps uh, for those people who have a standing of life uh, that brings them every day around the world, uh, that have a, a, an international life, but this is not the real life of common, of common people. So what uh, uh, have you done in this respect? Uh, uh, or more simply, to put it simply, what has the conference done for common people, actually? Um, and to... Uh, Uh, in a way to set aside this perception that might be of a very distant uh, body not having to do with, with real life. Yeah, it's, it's funny that that discipline Which is has the social dimension. I mean, it, it, yes, there is a social dimension. Yeah, the, the discipline has that, that image. I have got that image, I'm afraid, also at university. 
and when I my pre my, the job that I had before coming to the conference as a practicing lawyer, I saw these gray green books in the library, and I didn't feel particularly attracted to them. The man who persuaded me to to make the move was Georges Strauss, and uh, my predecessor, and he was not only a savant, but he was also a very, very practical man. And in fact, if you look at the history of the Hague Conference, you will see that Tobias Asser himself was, before everything, a, a practicing lawyer. So there is a long tradition in the Hague Conference of being interested uh, and, and working for, um, for, for people. Um, I think uh, the, 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 your question is, is linked to what we discussed on, uh, on the, 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 the change, the movement from uh, emphasis on, on uh, coexistence to, to, to uh, cooperation. When we, um, the Hague Conference had done the, did the work on the Convention on Protection of Minors in 1961, there was one problem that could not be solved, and that was the abduction of children. One aspect of that was that countries were hesitant to return children of their own nationality to other countries. That had to be overcome. But it was also clear that a pure uh, traditional convention with rules on jurisdiction would not do the job. You needed to provide assistance to parents who needed to locate their child, uh, to find out where the, the other parent was, uh, to assist them with making applications and so on. So the uh, 1980 convention on child abduction <coughs> was a, a real breakthrough by creating a system of administrative cooperation between among countries in addition to uh, the, the traditional uh, jurisdictional uh, uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that success, we have built the adoption convention and all the other instruments that you had uh, done. And that created the need to do more on uh, providing central authorities with uh, tools, with good practice guides, uh, with uh, um, practical handbooks, mm. extending also to, to practicing lawyers. And we have worked hard together and got, got a lot of response also from professional organizations, from uh, lawyers' organizations, viciers, uh, they are in the room, um, and, and so, uh, and, and academics. Um, so professional uh, associations have brought uh, a lot of assistance to the conference in its activity. Yeah, and, and I think what I share with my colleagues is deep inside a feeling that there is a basic unity of, 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 of the human family and that we, uh, we are not working for um, conventions on the books but want to rea really see practical uh, results. Mm -hmm. And our whole working method is based on that. We do empirical research, we look at how can we be useful, we make conventions. If they are not useful, we review them and we may make new ones. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think this is a very important, uh, very important question. A very important answer you you gave so on this uh, uh, that the conference is is serving the people and not just uh, uh, a few people or a limited number of people and currently with migration so this is ex extremely important uh, what uh, what to do uh, a last question before giving the floor to the to the audience um, uh, the the results uh, of uh, of your uh, of your uh, mandate as uh, Secretary General have been prodigious. I mean, uh, everybody recognizes you, uh, and has been recognized even this afternoon, you have done an excellent job. And you, you can be proud of what you have done. But is that you have regret? Is that you have the dreams that are going to stay in the tiroir? Chacun en a, évidemment. <laughs> Donc, ça serait Des bizarre que le secrétaire général n'en ait pas, mais... Euh, Laisse-moi dire d'abord que beaucoup de mes rêves ont été vérifiés et que, que je suis très, très, très content et euh, très heureux d'avoir pu, pu les réaliser. Euh, des regrets, il y en a des milliers, évidemment. Des, des, des rêves qui ne sont pas euh, concrétisés, oui. Là... Euh, Je dois être un peu plus grand, prudent parce que certains euh, de ces rêves euh, figurent sur l'ordre du jour des de jours qui viennent. Et là, le conseil euh, devrait se prononcer. Euh, mais par exemple, euh, j'ai un peu... Alors, on ne parle pas du rêve commun qu'on a. Voilà. Donc, voilà. Et on, on, oui, on a entendu de nouvelles, <rire> pour, pour de nouveaux rêves qui sont suggérés <rire> par le panel. 
Euh, prenons un exemple un peu. J'ai une certaine responsabilité pour le fait que le sujet des, des jugements a été proposé à la conférence plutôt que dans une relation bilatérale entre les États-Unis et l'Union européenne. Et parfois, je me suis dit, euh, my God, qu'est-ce que j'ai fait parce que c'était difficile. On a, heureusement, on est arrivé à conclure une convention sur l'élection de, de fort, mais le rêve est allé au-delà de cela, n'est-ce pas et, l'idée de, et tu as eu un rôle très très important dans cet exercice, nos rêves allaient au-delà de, de, de cela. Je garde l'espoir qu'on trouve des moyens, l'enthousiasme pour euh, aller de, de, de l'avant et euh, arriver à un instrument utile pour le monde entier euh, sur la reconnaissance et l'exécution des jugements et peut-être au-delà de, de cela. Donc ça serait, là je serais vraiment très content si on pouvait réaliser cela. Euh, il y a d'autres points. Euh, L'accès aux droits étrangers, euh, j'ai toujours cru que ça, aurait été une, ça pourrait toujours être un, un, un sujet intéressant. Je crois que le monde en a besoin, le monde juridique en a besoin. Euh, on a une bonne base dans les recherches. On a euh, convoqué des réunions d'experts qui ont donné leur avis euh, de manière très convaincue. Donc, euh, je crois que ça mérite, euh, peut-être, pas nécessairement demain, mais euh, être exploré. Je crois aussi que si on prend, par exemple, le, la situation des couples non mariés, n'est-ce pas L'idée de la conférence est que c'est l'idée du pluralisme juridique. On accepte qu'un juge d'un autre pays, en appliquant son loi, sa loi, arrive à une autre solution que, 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 que nous que les systèmes sont, 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 sont différents, mais dans la mesure où deux personnes ont pu légitimement, selon leur loi, entrer dans un partenariat, par exemple, est-ce qu'il ne serait pas normal qu'on reconnaisse cette situation dans d'autres pays, pourvu que cette relation n'a pas de, 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 de perturbe l'ordre public de, du pays de la reconnaissance je crois que c'est un sujet qu'il faudrait approfondir. Euh, mais bon, chacun, évidemment, on ne peut pas... Quelquefois, il faut savoir attendre les bons moments pour, voilà, euh, pour les voilà, projets. Oui, le moment oui, viendra, oui, oui. on espère, pour tous ces, ces projets. Euh, Peut-être, à ce stade, je vois que l'heure avance. Est-ce que... Euh, moi, j'ai eu la, la chance de poser une série de questions à Hans, mais... Est-ce que vous voulez profiter et poser des questions vous-même maintenant C'est une, une opportunité unique, donc euh, profitez-en. Any question you want to put to the Secretary General, to Hans von Lohm, from the... No questions. I may have regrets, you may have regrets, so what... Unless you have what, a question for them. <laughs> what, what should I have done? What should, what should we do? What should we do more? Where would you like to put the emphasis? But if you ask, uh, if, uh, uh, to, if uh, ask them to ask where you didn't do enough, there would be no answer because the answer is that you did. Uh, prodigious view that far, far more than you could have done during your mandate. So uh, there could be no question in this, in this respect. Oh, please. En ma qualité de secrétaire général de l'Académie de droit international de l'AE. Parce que je voudrais cette occasion, enfin, nous sommes dans le bâtiment, et je voudrais cette occasion d'abord. Euh, dire euh, toute la bonne collaboration que, grâce à M. Van Loon, nous avons eue avec la conférence. Et, et je voudrais lui poser une, une question qui serait euh, qui est la suivante. Enfin, Est-ce qu'il ne pense pas qu'il euh, y aurait tout de même un, un très grand intérêt à, à renforcer encore ces, ces relations Après tout, nous parlons de projet. Nous parlons de ce que sera l'avenir. Et l'avenir, euh, malheureusement pour nous, il n'est pas entre nos mains. Il est entre nos mains de la jeunesse. Et la jeunesse, ce sont les étudiants, ce sont ceux que nous formons dans les universités. On a fait allusion tout à l'heure à des insuffisances dans les facultés. Mais l'académie, elle, 
et c'est aussi de, de, de former ces, ces jeunes, de former les, les juristes de tous vos pays. Et, et je pense qu'il faudrait réfléchir à, à de meilleures articulations, finalement, entre le, le monde de l'enseignement et de la recherche et, et le monde de la pratique. Vous, vous avez déjà fait beaucoup, mais euh, je pense qu'il faudrait que, que l'on continue dans cette voie. Et je serais intéressé d'avoir votre sentiment là-dessus. Ouais, merci, merci beaucoup pour votre question. Et je dirais presque que c'est à mon successeur d'y répondre. Mais je le connais un peu et je crois qu'il va vous dire sans réserve, en principe, très très volontiers. Mettons-nous lundi ensemble et on, on va... Oui, je, je, surtout, si l'Académie nous, pourrait nous joindre dans nos efforts aussi de travailler à un niveau parfois très proche des gens et très pratique. Parce que ça, c'est évidemment notre, notre mandat, de travailler pour la bonne mise en œuvre euh, des, de nos instruments. On peut, peut en faire un groupe, on peut combiner des conventions. Et donc là, on monte un peu au, à un niveau plus, plus général peut-être, mais le focus sera toujours sur l'aspect très pratique. Donc... Euh, mais évidemment, la, la théorie et la pratique se, doivent se, se rejoindre. Donc, je, je dirais qu'il y a là un, un très bel, bel avenir. Mais encore une fois, c'est à Christophe Bernasconi d'explorer cela en premier lieu avec vous. Je serai à 100%, personnellement, 100% euh, <rire> intéressé aussi à, à contribuer à ce, ce dialogue. Et le professeur Donné, vous-même. Euh, vous avez mis l'accent sur un problème essentiel, en fait, parce que les the, the, the conventions uh, give a lot of opportunities to people and do a lot for people. We, we discussed that earlier. But uh, it's necessary that people know that there are these opportunities because sometimes states, if people in the state are not educated, not push to have the implementation carried out, uh, governmental authorities may be uh, not aware or reluctant to take uh, engagements and to, and to work on this. So it's education is extremely important. Education as the education given by the academy worldwide is extremely important in this respect and goes to, to the future, actually, of the implementation, as you say. Et je voudrais encore remercier M. Daudet, le secrétaire général, pour nous avoir permis, en tant que conférence, de d'avoir un, un slot dans votre programme tous les semestres d'été. Ça a été une joie pour mes collègues et moi, et j'espère aussi utile pour les étudiants. Any more questions from the audience? Please, don't hesitate. If you have any, any questions, please. Uh, there is a micro, probably. Yeah. Hello, my name is Kate Gibson. I am a legal advisor at the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, so I'm an outsider to this process, and I appreciate um, uh, your hospitality here, letting me listen in today. Um, I'm coming from another conference which featured um, a question and answer session uh, between the American and Canadian um, treaty negotiators, and they were having a debate about whether or not um, the primary purpose in treaties is to set out the exact obligations that will um, apply to the countries set in stone at the time of drafting, whether or not the treaty should be more general processes, um, set out principles, and then allow um, the countries to implement them and allow that implementation to sort of evolve and develop as, as the needs arise. I was wondering for your thoughts on that question. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for, for that question. Yes. Now, uh, our conventions generally um, deal with rights and obligations uh, of, of private citizens, uh, companies, and, and so on. And they are destined to be applied directly by the judges and authorities in, in the different countries. So they are self-executing necessarily in order to, uh, to be useful. So uh, our efforts has all, effort has always been to uh, craft rules that are as precise as possible, as predictable as possible to give the judges and authorities greatest chance to apply them uh, consistently. So that may be a little different mm. from, from other uh, uh, treaties. Um, and of course, to the extent that we 
create machinery for the implementation of the conventions, the uh, central authorities and so on, there the states have a certain freedom to, uh, to and, and the, the, the directions are not, not that strict, but in principle I would say that uh, our efforts should be directed at um, making it possible for the conventions to be applied at a very local direct level by the authorities and courts and that private parties can, can know what their um, rights and obligations are, or at least the system of law that applies them. But of course, notwithstanding that, there are always margins for interpretation. And I, I, I think the, the, the advisory role of the Permanent Bureau in uh, uh, giving uh, the, the gist of the different conventions in order to have a uniform interpretation is essential. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean yeah. I don't no, know absolutely. how much you are uh, involved, all of you in the Permanent Bureau, on this acti advisory activity, yeah. on how to implement in order to have a, a harmonized implementation. No, you, but you, it's, it, I, I, I have the impression it's sometimes uh, almost a quasi-judicial <laughs> activity you are performing. Uh, you're quite right. And of course, we, we, we do our efforts to, uh, to, to, to make very precise rules, but we do not always achieve, and, and sometimes there has to be a, 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 sort of a certain uh, margin. Or, uh, um, and then there, there may be, uh, be difficulties. A good example is the, the Child Abduction Convention, which is basically a very straightforward, simple instrument, but there is an enormous variety of uh, um, approaches, unfortunately, to, to, uh, to, to certain uh, articles. Now, we don't have the benefit of uh, interpretation by the uh, International Court of Justice here of our conventions, that's maybe something uh, for the future. There's an old protocol, by the way, of 1931, which provided for um, that uh, solution, at least uh, competence of the uh, predecessor of the International Court of Justice. So we have to rely on peer review by central authorities. We convene meetings where we uh, special commission review meetings of different countries, uh, states, parties, to discuss dis differences in interpretation and um, we provide good practice guides to help um, promote consistency uh, of, uh, of interpretation. But basically our starting point I think should still be to make rules as precise as possible because they are directed not to states but to the courts and authorities and individuals that uh, apply them. Sure. Any, any more questions? We still have some minutes in case. Uh, please, time. Et les problèmes, la pratique et les problèmes qui se posent pour, pour le bureau permanent. Et, et il est maintenant inconcevable que euh, le bureau permanent serait réduit à une 5 ans, euh, disons 5 ou plus 6, ou peut-être plus de, de grands juristes et de, de, de euh, secrétaires très efficaces, mais c'est tout. Enfin, il est inconcevable que, euh, et, que, que le travail se réduit. Oui, et grâce à à ah, votre inventivité, je dirais qu'il y a pas mal de jeunes juristes qui ont passé de assez longues périodes au, à la haie et se sont connus. Sont... C'est déjà un aspect de la conférence euh, que je voudrais souligner parce que c'est pendant le, la période du secrétariat Hans, ouais. général d'Arns que cette. C'est là que s'est produit. Euh, oui. Voilà. Thank you very much for this okay. complimentary. Well, please, Hans. On n'avait pas de choix. Il fallait faire appel à. à, à, à on n'avait pas de choix. Il fallait bien faire appel à, à ces, ces, ces jeunes, si j'ose dire. Et nous devons être énormément reconnaissants à, à tous ceux qui nous ont 
euh, à des, très souvent à leurs propres frais, n'est-ce pas Ils viennent ici. Euh, on ne peut pas les, 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 les payer ou pas payer beaucoup. Et, euh, non, mais ça a été une, une aide fantastique euh, et, et aussi très intéressante pour nous parce qu'on a reçu des, des gens des pays qui euh, étaient nouveaux pour, pour nous. Oui, ça a été une expérience très enrichissante et j'espère beaucoup qu'on pourra continuer avec ça. Le problème, c'est un peu que dans notre bâtiment actuel, l'espace devient un peu réduit et on doit, on doit très souvent refuser des demandes. Et en plus, on n'a pas toujours le staff qui pourrait les accompagner de manière correcte. Donc là, théoriquement, on pourrait faire beaucoup plus encore. Well, uh, uh, we need more space, maybe also, but uh, I remember when the conference was in Zeestraat, there huh? were two, three rooms. Then in Javastraat became six or seven rooms, six maybe. And then the new building now, there are more. And maybe uh, the next, the future will be in a, in a new building or in the next and, and to the, that and building. The, yeah, and the regional offices may. And then you have the regional offices so as well. well. So next, it's, uh, next one in Africa. That's it's exactly it's the growth of the yeah. of the. Um, well, we will not go into new um, into what we have to do in the future because the previous panel already told us you have to do this on Monday, this on Tuesday, this on Wednesday. So if we know, I mean, uh, Christophe Bernasconi knows exactly what, uh, what he has to do yeah. as of <laughs> next week on. Maybe this week is still, but until when he'll take uh, over the position of, uh, of Secretary General. Uh, well, this has been a very interesting conversation. I, I hope that through this interview, the audience could receive a special insight into the work of the conference, which is uh, a special entity, I think. The conference is um, a legal organization, of course, but uh, I would say, first of all, is a, a legal uh, community um, with members and friends all over the world, uh, which includes delegates, country representatives, experts, academics, uh, private practitioners and others, judges, uh, who work together, if uh, I dare to say, under the same flag, mm -hmm. actually, to harmonize private law in the respect for legal differences, uh, with a view to setting aside obstacles that hinder the movement of, uh, of people in, in our global world. So in, in some respect, uh, uh, the conference is giving a true contribution to the global society we are, we are facing, uh, facing now. And I believe that all of us must be extremely grateful to Hans van Loon, uh, first for being here in this conference, in having this interview, but in general for having, uh, as a whole, for having performed um, a, a leadership role in the, this uh, strive towards cooperation and uh, with him we should associate in our um, gratitude uh, uh, the members of the Permanent Bureau. Um, Christophe Bernasconi, obviously Philippe Lorty, Marta Pertegas, Luis Ellen Teitz, and uh, uh, all the wonderful team, uh, Toyn has made reference to, to them, the wonderful team of women and men that uh, cooperate with the Permanent Bureau in the Permanent Bureau, in not, only, not only in The Hague. Um, their commitment, their achievements have been really uh, excellent during three, these decades. Uh, um, Hans, uh, mon cher, tu as fait un travail magnifique. Chapeau. Well done. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, euh, euh, cher Forster, et ce que, tu as, ce que tu as dit est vrai. Et ce qui me manquera le plus, c'est euh, ce miracle d'être parti d'une très grande famille. Mes collègues proches, non seulement les juristes, mais tout le staff qui était extraordinaire, qui, qui, est, qui reste extraordinaire, euh, le contact avec les, les délégués, les experts, 
euh, les académiques, les, les, les autorités centrales, les, les juristes, les professionnels. Euh, ça, 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 c'est le côté le plus, plus difficile qui, 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 qui me manquera. Euh, et ça a été un énorme privilège de travailler avec vous, euh, vous tous. Mais il y a encore du travail à faire jusqu'à date, jusqu'au 1er juillet. Donc, euh, on se reverra encore. Un grand merci à toi, Fausto, pour avoir. C'était oui. un plaisir. Euh, alors, euh, nous en terminons avec euh, cette entrevue, mais la fête continue. Comme on dit, euh, avant de passer à la réception qu'on aura après, je donne la parole à Christophe Bernasconi, qui a encore quelque chose à dire. Je ne dis pas le sujet, parce que ce sera lui qui le dira. Merci, Fausto. Si je me permets de vous joindre au podium à ce moment-ci, c'est d'une part, et je le rassure tout de suite, tendre la main au professeur Dourdes, secrétaire général de l'Académie, et confirmer que nous restons bien évidemment parfaitement intéressés à continuer la collaboration et à l'intensifier. Mais si euh, je vous joins ici, c'est surtout aussi pour annoncer à Hans que c'est le moment où ces célébrations prennent peut-être une tournure un peu plus inattendue pour toi. Je crains que la réception ne devra attendre un peu. 35 ans au sein de l'organisation, au service de l'organisation, dont presque la moitié en tant que secrétaire général. Si je compte bien, Hans, tu as très activement participé à la préparation l'élaboration de neuf conventions, de la révision d'un statut. Tu as plus que fait doubler le nombre d'États membres de l'organisation, le nombre d'États non membres mais participants aux travaux euh, de la conférence a connu un essor absolument euh, remarquable. Euh, nous avons eu la chance d'ouvrir deux bureaux régionaux. Tout ça n'est que la face la plus visible des résultats de tes engagements. Mais nous avons pu constater, encore une fois, tout au long de l'entretien avec, euh, avec Fausto, combien tu t'es dévoué et que tu continues à te dévouer pour cette organisation qui te tient tellement à cœur, qui nous tient tant à cœur. Nous tous qui sommes présents ici et à travers nous, je crois tout le monde, de ceux qui ont bénéficié d'une manière ou d'une autre des travaux de la conférence, nous ne pouvons effectivement que lever notre chapeau et te dire très sincèrement, de tout cœur, un grand merci, Hans. Alors, je dis tout de suite ce que je répète à tout le monde, tu es et tu restes secrétaire général jusqu'à la fin du mois de juin, mais nous avons voulu profiter de la présence des dignitaires des représentants d'État, d'experts, d'amis, de collègues, pour te faire une petite surprise. Having worked closely with Hans over the years, I know that the job is highly demanding, but at the same time extremely rewarding, not just in terms of the work produced, but also in terms, and in particular in terms of the people encountered along the way. In Hans's case, many of these people have become long, lifelong friends. This gave us an idea at the Permanent Bureau, an idea that we had to keep secret from you and bring to fruition on the call without you getting suspicious in any way. And while, of course, je rassure les membres, trying at the same time to do all the real work that had to be done. But I think we managed. We have contacted, behind your back, a few people, in fact, quite a few people, and these people have come together as friends, Hans, to offer a book of essays in your honor. Oh, no. Oh, no. A Liber Amicorum in the fullest the truest sense of the term. Over the past months, the Permanent Bureau has secretly organized 
and collected essays from some 56 contributors. A lot of them, I'm very happy to say, are here today. They comprise subject matter experts, delegates designated by various states and international organizations, as well as present and past colleagues from the Permanent Bureau. The contributions which make up a volume of over 700 pages offer insights on a wide range of current legal issues, historical accounts, cross-disciplinary perspectives, which aptly reflect your commitment to private international law, which actually is the title of this book. Ce travail en catimini fut certes un travail d'équipe dont je ne suis que le fier et heureux porte-parole. Mais ce travail n'aurait jamais vu le jour sans les talents d'organisation, la patience, la discrétion et la bonne humeur de ton assistante personnelle, Sophie Pinault, qui a magistralement géré et orchestré le tout. Qu'il me soit permis ici, au nom de toutes celles et de tous ceux qui ont été impliqués dans l'organisation et la réalisation de cette petite surprise, de lui dire un grand merci. Avec cela, Hans, il me fait grand plaisir, au nom de tous tes amis du bureau permanent, présents et, et passés, au nom de tes très nombreux amis qui n'ont pas hésité à se joindre à cette merveilleuse aventure, et aussi au, au nom de tu aurais bien voulu s'associer à l'aventure, mais n'ont pu le faire par manque de temps. Il me fait grand plaisir, au nom de tout ce beau monde, de t'offrir ces mélanges. Incroyable. Merci. Ça va prendre que là. Chers amis, je suis sans mots. Je suis vraiment. Je suis sans moi, je suis vraiment speechless. Et, et, et surtout, comment avez-vous pu faire ça sans, sans que je, le, le, je puisse le, le, le savoir J'essaie de quand même de suivre un peu ce qui se passe au bureau permanent. Je sais que je n'arrive pas toujours. Mais faire un travail comme ça, euh, rester en correspondance avec, avec tout le monde, rappeler, euh, je sais que c'est incroyable ce travail. Donc je suis vraiment perplexe et... Euh, je ne peux 